So this, this November, we are um, growing a garden of gratitude. And it's so funny that I would think of this for this sermon series since I do not have a green thumb, almost everything I touch dies, but I know that this community, so raise your hand if you are a gardener here. You like tending, see right, like so many. We were at a farm last night. Who would have thought, if you'd asked me a year and a half ago as I was looking at churches, like, by the way, the church you're going to, you're gonna spend a night in a farm. I would have been like, what is happening? <laughs> but the farm is great, I love the farm. I actually didn't spend the night because I knew I'd need to kind of be somewhat fresh for today. Uh, but I think the thing that we sort of realized when we were at the farm, our, our car arrived there listening to Taylor Swift. And maybe some of the, maybe some of the pumpkins were Taylor Swift related, maybe. Um, I love that. I love that for them and for me. Um, but the thing that helped us kind of understand as we we're raising money for the bridge communities, for people who experience housing insecurity, right? is that in cold nights like that, when you don't have a house to go to, it's cold, right? People saw the pictures last night and I was bundled up. I thought, oh, I need a, I had, I had a sweatshirt on, I'll be fine. And I had to get gloves out, we got hats. I got really, really cold in a way that was sort of funny, I think, to others, because I'm from Southern California. But it's a reminder, right, that not everyone has heating or a hot shower, right? Not everyone has the promise of a house that keeps them safe and secure and warm. And so I love that our youth did that. Thank you all for doing that. So again, we're on our Good Seeds Sunday. All Saints, so Saints kind of, we're gonna get into that with the idea of seeds. But for those of you who followed, I ran around Puerto Vallarta for a couple weeks. Thank you for my vacation. Um, it was lovely. Everywhere I was, there were evidence of what they celebrate this time of year. Does anyone know what they celebrate this time of year? Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos. You know, I came from PV, now I can say it all fancy. The Day of the Dead. In the West, of course, we celebrate All Saints Day. Um, we also celebrate All Hallows' Eve, right? Halloween, kind of the thought of, of ancestors coming back and maybe needing to mask ourselves from the spirits, right? Puerto Vallarta boasts the largest sort of um, accessible Dia de los Muertos display. It was everywhere in this tiny town, this tiny seaside town. And they boast the largest Katrina in the world. Does anyone know what the Katrina is? The Katrina is. It's a symbol for the Day of the Dead. It's a beautiful female dressed, she's a skeleton. Have you seen the skeletons, right? Um, dressed in finery, usually, right? So it's like the irony of like a skeleton dressed in usually a poofy, poofy dress, something very fancy. Um, of course, you can see evidence of a lot of that in cultural things that come out with, with masks made of skeletons, usually colorful, right? Usually beautiful kind of things. This tradition dates back thousands of years to Mesopotamia, Meso Mesoamerica, South America, with the Aztec goddess of death. So who knew that? Does anyone knew that? Yeah, I like looked it up for you, you're welcome. The name of that goddess of death from the Aztecs, I cannot pronounce and I won't even try in this sermon, but we shall call her as some do, the Dame of the Dead. The Dame of the Dead. So this goes back thousands of years. Right, it's, way, it's why on the makeshift altars, if you've ever seen a Dia de los Muertos altar, it usually has pictures of people who've come before. They do it a little different than we do it. Um, there's usually bread, right? And things that are affinity for the people who've come before. It's supposed to sort of assist them into the afterlife with this dame of the dead who oversees this process. We get something called the La Cavera Katrina, the origin of it is a cartoon by Mexican artist Jose Posada. It's thought to have been drawn around the time of the Mexican Revolution, early 20th century. And it was originally actually meant to be a scathing criticism of rich aristocrats, right? In Mexico and South America, taking on the garb of Western European finery. While the world was burning around them and people were dying, and a revolution was going on with the people feeling like they are not treated equally. And so the Katrina, actually, the seeds of the Katrina 
is the idea of revolution and the idea that the upper crust, the rich in society, don't quite understand what's going on. The dream of justice in a world of division and inequity. And later, artist Diego Rivera, famous husband of Frida Kahlo, who knows Frida Kahlo, right? That's why I pluck. Would immortalize, <laughs> just kidding, she's lovely, she's lovely. Would immortalize its image in the Katrina for culture, and this is where it's stuck. The dream of a life well lived and celebrated this time of year. We don't necessarily associate it with its origins. It has taken on a life of its own. So when you go into places, there will be what's called Katrinas and Katrins, right? Men and women, skeletons dressed in all sorts of creative ways. Um, the images are associated forever with this time of year. The seeds of this dream is truly an understanding that death is not to be feared. Death is a part of life and we should embrace it and celebrate it, celebrating life and death in all its complexity, and of course, remember those who have gone before us. Again, we of course don't have Katrinas here, but we do have candles, right? Candles which symbolize the light that still burns in our memories of those who have gone before us. We keep those who've gone before us, our parents and grandparents, maybe children, if that's been a difficult moment for you, um, cousins, people in our lives who've gone before us. We light candles for them. We keep them alive in our minds, and we call them saints, right? At St. Matthew, we're going to honor several in a particular way today. Uh, their names are in uh, the bulletin. They are our saints, right? We will light candles in their honor and say their names and ring a bell. And later during communion, when you come forward, you will have a chance, if you so choose, you don't have to, to honor any who've gone before you, any saints in your life who no longer are around. You can light a candle and you can either leave it on the table or if you so choose, you may walk it up and we've given space for you to put it on the altar. I know in history, we've sort of walked around with the candles and put them other places, but I'm very aware that the fire department may not enjoy that. So leave it on the table, bring it up front. We love to have you honor whoever has gone before you, who you consider a saint. We know now, of course, we live in a time where there are wars and rumors of wars, right? We live in a time of great division, right? There are people in our midst struggling. We have loved ones in the hospital, loved ones with diagnosis, and you are invited to light a candle for them as well, for hope, for anyone you might have lost, anyone you're thinking of, anyone who's no longer here, anyone you wish to be here longer. And we, this month, are leaning into gratitude on our way to Thanksgiving and Advent. And of course, you've also gotten information about stewardship and giving. Thanks for Bruce for reminding us that. And it's a reminder that honoring the past and living into the future is, of course, helped and animated by our collective generosity and our resources. I'm a firm believer that in any given church community, there's all we need. If you're watching online and you're part of our community, if you're part of our community here, if you're part of our community and you're watching later, you are a part of this community and you make, up, make sure that we have everything we need. There's nothing that we need that isn't here. God has given us all we need. So again, for stewardship, give as you feel led and we will celebrate it next week. Our sermon series, Garden of Gratitude, today is All Saints Sunday and we're talking about good seeds. Next week we'll talk about good soil, then we'll talk about our good gardeners, and then we'll end with our good fruit, the cycle of life. And again, the irony that I am the one that's discussing all of these things is not lost on me, the non-gardener. So we're going, of course, to the first letter to Thessalonica. Thank you so much, Bill, for reading it. In this book, Paul challenges the newly formed church in many areas, but he does so through the lens of gratitude. I don't know if you know that when Bill was reading it, what Paul leaned into as he's talking about this church is what? Be thankful. We are thankful for you. He does through the lens of gratitude. Paul has a dream for the future church to be one of love and grace and goodness and gratitude. And so I would, I would say that that is the good seeds of the genesis of the church in all. That God has chosen us all to be a part of this big family of God in this particular setting. The foundation of our faith and our church growth is gratitude for God's lavish and inclusive love. 
We are starting with seeds because without good seeds, soil, gardeners, and fruit are literally fruitless, right? That's where it begins, the seeds. And of course, what is a seed? It is a baby of whatever it will turn into. A seed is a baby. It's a tiny thing, an embryonic plant covered in a coating to keep it safe until it can be planted and bloom and become the thing that it's created to be. It is the genesis or beginning of all things. I would say seeds hold the dreams of future growth. Seeds hold the dream of future growth. When a tree has seeds and it falls to the ground, that seed is a dream that the tree dreamed for the future. And for the early church and its authors, the flower of love or joy or peace or patience was always the result of their dream of the genesis of gratitude, the seed of gratefulness and thankfulness. Being open to all that God is doing and having an awareness that we should be thankful, I think it's the bedrock of our faith as Christians to be grateful for what we have. And today we celebrate All Saints Day, a day when we remember again the saints in our lives and in our community, in our world, in our church, the people who do things and have done things selflessly and joyfully and with great generosity. And it brought me back to last year's President Council sermon, which happens at the end of January. Ken is already feeling the pressure, although it's going to be amazing. Um, I was struck by Annette. So where's Annette? Was our president, council president last year. I, I asked her, she, part of it um, she sent to me. She read, and I think she got this from Don Schubert, she read the blessing and the prayer from the founding pastor at St. Matthew. He wrote this in 1961. Have you heard it? Some of you have heard it. I'm going to read it to you. So in 1961, Harold Dobstaff, so if you don't know, when I first got here and they said Dobstaff Fellowship Hall, I said, what is a Dobstaff? Is it a different kind of staff than normal staff? <laughs> is, is that the lang, you know, the Wheaton lang, you know, slang for like church staff is like Dobstaff, like Dubstaff, but no. Dobstaff is a person who we have great gratitude for because he sowed the seeds for all that we have today. And this is his dream. Again, think about this in 1961. My dream for St. Matthew, United Church of Christ, is concerned with more than brick and stone and wood and mortar. Even though it is true that we all look forward to that day when we will have a building of our very own. Look, we do. The dream is fulfilled. My dream concerns the spirit that will ever live within this church. Thus, my dream is that this church may ever be a church adequate for ministering to every person who seeks its services. In 1961, every person, no limit on that. A church with a warm heart, ever willing to give of itself for the sake of others. A church with an open mind, always willing to listen to and respect other people's thoughts and opinions, no matter how different they may seem to be from our own. A church that cares for the least and the last, right? Our youth have shown that, that we continue that on today. And those who went to Biloxi, right? That comforts the age, challenges the young, revives the weary, and continually speaks the good news of God's forgiveness, love, and mercy. Not God's wrath, right? love and mercy. A church that knows no division of race or class or nationality, that builds no walls economically, socially, or politically. A church with an open door and an open membership to who? All people. A church that looks forward as well as backward. A church as high as the ideals of Jesus, as broad as the earth's surface, and as low as the humblest human. A church that is not afraid to work for and to witness to its faith. A church that is always willing to come together for periods of worship and prayer. A church that inspires courage for this life and hope for the life to come. A church in which all people may find Christ. A church of the living God. This is my dream for this church. I pray it might become your dream. Isn't that amazing? That's the seeds of our church. The seeds of our church is this dream that leads out in gratitude for the things that are already happening and the things that are to come. And the word all is used almost in every sentence, right? In 1961, 
We had a pastor who said, all are welcome. I think that's amazing. I don't know if he understood what that meant for today, if he ever thought a woman would be the senior pastor of this church. I don't know. If he ever thought that um, I would create pride as a liturgy, that we would be the place where in, I think, 2020, with the pride parade started in Wheaton, right? I don't know if that was a part of his dream, but I have to think he's looking onto us and going, good job good and faithful servants, you have lived into my dream in ways that I can't even imagine. And so we remember that dream. We remember with gratitude the people that have come before, that have given animated life and love and theology and goodness to this place. And so I think about gratitude, right? Gratitude, Diane Butler Bass says, one of my favorite authors, is a resilience of sorts. The defiance of kindness in the face of anger, of connection in the face of division, and hope in the face of fear. Gratitude empowers us. Gratitude makes all things new. Gratitude is strongest, dearest, most robust and radical when things are actually really hard, really hard. Being grateful isn't a magic wand or a kind of prosperity mantra. Rather, it rearranges the way we see the world. As we practice redirecting our attention towards the gifts in our lives, gratitude lessens our fears, strengthens our hearts, and builds our resilience. Again, Pastor Dobstaff had a dream of a church with an open door policy, an open mind policy in which all people were embraced and welcomed and celebrated in gratitude. And so my prayer is that we continue on. I'd like to think again, that he would be thrilled with where we are, that the seeds that he had sowed are coming to fruition even now. That the house, the dreams of the future growth, right? The seeds of that, that house the future growth are all here and all we have is what we need. And that we lean into the fact that the seeds may not grow how we want them to grow, but they are going to be beautiful and effervescent because the seeds are healthy and good. And so my prayer and my hope is that we continue to have dreams for the current and future church and that we lean into the all-inclusive welcome of our founding pastor. May our seeds of growth be ones of goodness and kindness and gratitude. May we continue to be grateful for all that God is doing. Amen.